Bibles this morning, I invite you to take them and go with me to the book of Jonah, chapter number 3, please. The book of Jonah, chapter number 3, is where we'll find our text for the message this morning. Third chapter of the book of Jonah, towards the end of your Old Testament. And uh, we're going to be looking here at the first couple of verses, and uh, we'll allow you to remain seated as we have just a fairly short uh, passage of Scripture to read this morning for our text. And, uh, and I want you to focus in here on the first couple of verses in Jonah chapter number 3, where the Bible reads, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. With God's help this morning, I'd like to preach a message that I've simply entitled, The Second Time. We find that phrase in Jonah chapter number 3 in verse number 1, and I believe it's a significant phrase. I think it reveals something to us about the forgiving work and restoration of Almighty God in our lives. Would you bow your heads with me and we'll pray and we'll ask for the Lord's blessing on the reading of His Word here this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this day and we thank You for what wonderful grace that we have experienced, uh, Lord, at Your hand. As we sung just a moment ago, what, what grace is this? We, we, we certainly uh, cannot even imagine that you would love us the way that you do. Lord, that you would give to us the way that you give to us. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to appreciate this grace. And Lord, may we, through your power and your strength, may we extend it to others. Lord, we see a picture of your grace and, and your forgiveness and your mercy in this particular passage. Lord, rather than Lord, uh, rather than taking Jonah and, uh, Lord, never using him again because of his disobedience, Lord, you chose to forgive. And you chose to recommission him and to send him on his way. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to learn something from this, uh, Lord, this great truth found in this particular passage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm certainly thankful for second chances. I have been given many second chances throughout my life, and in some respects, third and fourth and fifth and sixth chances. And I suppose perhaps maybe you're a little like me. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've messed up. I've disappointed some people. I've let some people down. And yet, for the most part, for the people that I have interacted with and perhaps that I have hurt in some way in my life and in their life, I have experienced a great, a great deal of grace and forgiveness uh, from them. And, uh, and I think perhaps it's because I spent most of my life growing up in the church. And, uh, and so we would presume the vast majority of people that are faithful in attending church, those would have been the people that I would have rubbed shoulders with. Most of them would know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And, and because he has forgiven them, we have, a, uh, we have an admonition in Scripture to turn around and to forgive others as we too have been forgiven. And uh, we, find this, we find this truth, I think, played out in this particular passage of Scripture. Uh, our example in forgiving others is the grace and forgiveness and restoration that comes from God the Father. In other words, as we watch Him at work in our own lives, and, and as we watch Him as He deals with mankind throughout the Scriptures, we find, uh, we, we find grace and forgiveness. Let me share with you a few passages of Scripture that seem uh, to bear this truth out. Consider with me Isaiah chapter number 1 and verse number 8, where the Bible says, Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. We find here God speaking through the prophet Isaiah telling the people, listen, you come to me and, and you get right with me and, and we reason together. You understand where I'm coming from and I certainly understand where you're coming from. And when you do this, you'll find that I will take your sins and though they be as scarlet, I shall turn them white as snow. And though they be, uh, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God's saying, you come to me, you repent and I will forgive, I will restore he says in Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse number 32, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, notice, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And so what is, the, what is the reason that we ought to be a forgiving people? Why? Why should you forgive others? Why should I forgive others? Because we have an example of God forgiving us for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and for his love and for his mercy. We find in 1 John chapter number 1 and verse number 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, all I have to do is come to him. I have to be sorry for my sins. I have to repent. I have to look at my sin and view it the way that he views it. And when I do that, when I come to him with humility of mind and heart and soul, and I repent, and I get forgiveness from God, that he restores me, that he washes away all of my sins, that he forgives me completely and totally, and I walk away from that encounter a brand new person. And you can have that happen in your life this very day. You don't have to wait. You don't have to jump through any hoops. You simply have to come to him on his terms, and you simply have to repent of your sin. Well, Jonah's time in the belly of the whale comes to an abrupt conclusion in Jonah's chapter number 2 and verse number 10. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Uh, he, is, he is expelled from the belly of that whale by the command of Almighty God. Uh, he finds himself suddenly no longer in the belly of this great fish, but now he finds himself on dry land. And as we consider this, this thought, we, we see the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God it, it is, is once again upon a dr arriving back on dry ground. God renews his call to Jonah that he go and that he preach judgment and wrath upon the city of Nineveh. We find that immediately in verse number one of the next chapter, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. God comes back to Jonah and God says, okay, Jonah, let's start all over again. Let, let's, 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 pretend like, let's pretend like what you just did didn't happen because as far as I'm concerned, you repented, you have turned from your sin, and, and I have cast your sin behind my back. I've buried it in the depths of the deepest sea. As far as the east is from the west, I will remember your sins no more. Let's start afresh and let's start anew. Now listen, let's go back to the beginning. I still want you to go to Nineveh. I still want you to preach the wrath and judgment that is coming upon them unless they repent. Now you have a choice to make. Will you respond positively? Will you do what you did not do the first time? And will you go to Nineveh? I believe God to be a God of second chances because I've experienced it personally. He has forgiven and he has restored me too many times to count. I have experienced it personally. I'm sure many of you have as well. I believe it also because I find it in the scriptures. I find it in this story. I find it throughout the word of God, throughout the Bible. I believe in a God who forgives. I believe in a God who's willing to give people a second chance. I don't know. I don't know how you came into the auditorium this morning. I don't know where you've been. I don't know all of the circumstances of your life. I know a great many of you, but I don't know every little choice and every little decision that you've made. And it may be that there are some that come into this room this morning in which you are perhaps out of favor with God. Uh, through, through some choices and decisions that you have made, uh, you've, you've, you've made some mistakes, you've gone your own way, you've chosen your own path, and perhaps you come into this room this morning and you think to yourself, would God, could God ever use me again? Would God, could God ever give me a second chance? And I'm here to tell you that if God can use Jonah again, if God would want to use Jonah again, then I would say that God would want to use you again. That God could use you again. And just because perhaps you hadn't ignored him at a certain point in time in your life, you know that he was speaking to you. And you know what he was saying. And you went and you did the opposite thing. I'm here to tell you that if you'll humble yourself today, and if you'll recognize that what you did was wrong, I'm here to tell you that God will want to speak to you a second time. And that God would want to deal with you a second time. I, I want us to notice that God could have easily put Jonah on the shelf with no hope that Jonah would ever hear God's call again. God's grace would have, would have simply been, Jonah, I'm going to allow you to live. Because, because I could, under the law, I could... I, I could take your life for your disobedience. But instead of God just essentially putting Jonah on the scrap heap of life, God comes to Jonah and God says, now let's try this all over again. 
It's not just my grace and my mercy to allow you to live, but I'm going to take it a step further. I'm going to recommission you. I am going to act as if what happened in the past has not happened, and I'm going to give you a second chance to do what I've called you to do. He truly is a God of second chances. I want you to notice just two simple thoughts from this passage of Scripture with a couple of key things underneath each thought. Number one, I want you to notice Jonah's test. Jonah's test. We find in this test being revealed, it being given or delivered in the first couple of verses of Jonah chapter number three. The Bible comes and says, it tells us in verse number two, arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. I got to tell you, when the the word came the first time, when the first first time the test came, Jonah did not pass. I am familiar with a failing grade in a test. I can assure you of that. I remember those days very, very, very well. Uh, my teachers used to grade with red ink, and, uh, and I could usually discern my test by the amount of red ink that was on it. If there, wasn't, if there wasn't much, it probably wasn't mine. And if there was a great deal, then it probably was mine. And, and I can remember it. Sometimes, some teachers, they would write F in big, bold letters, as if I didn't know already, you know. <laughs> I mean, you had to point, put it in the biggest font available. Sometimes they would circle it, and when I was in elementary school, the worst, the worst thing of all was at the very bottom, it would say, please sign and return. They did not want me to sign and return. No, they wanted me to take it home and to give it to my parents. That, that way they were guaranteed that they would see it, and then I would have to return it with their signature at the bottom. My dad got so good at signing an autograph because he signed it so many times on the bottom of my, on the bottom of my tests and my quizzes. I'm sure even maybe the greatest student here, uh, perhaps you're familiar with a time or two failing a test, failing a quiz, not, not getting a, a good grade, and, and, and maybe, maybe you just didn't have time to study, or you forgot about it, or maybe you just went through a period where you just didn't feel like it was all that important, and you just really didn't apply yourself. And so we find here that this test, in some respects, it's given over again. That used to happen every once in a while. There were times in which my class, we all did so poorly that it was, a, it was a revelation to the teacher. Well, apparently, they didn't understand what we dealt with. I think I maybe need to go back to the beginning and, and, and let's, let, me, let me try to get this information into you again. And, and, and here's what we're going to do. You take that test and you crumble it up because, you know, the vast majority of you failed it. And we're going to, clearly that indicates to me that I didn't teach it right. And so we're going to give it over again. We find that this test is a kind of a retake here for Jonah. That God comes back to him again and God says, hey, look, you failed it the first time, but I'm going to allow you to take it the second time. I want you to notice, we see as far as this test is concerned, Jonah's preparation is in the fact that he he repented. We see that in the previous chapter. Look in verse number nine of Jonah chapter number two. Jonah's repentance is clearly seen as he's in the belly of this great whale, this fish. And the Bible says he's praying and he says, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Uh, Look with me in verse number seven. The Bible says, when my soul fainted within me, I remember the Lord and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Jonah had a change of heart in the belly of that fish. Because we see in Jonah chapter number one, Jonah is called by God and Jonah goes the opposite direction. Jonah says, I have no interest in going to touch this. I will not obey the command that comes from God. And when he's given a chance there as the the storm is beating upon that ship and God is saying, Jonah, if you'll just repent, I'll make this storm go away. If you'll just do the right thing, I'll reverse the course of this storm and, and, and I'll make things easier for you. And you can get to Tarshish and, and Jonah says, I don't even want to do that. I would rather die than do what God wants me to do. And yet we find, as he comes into the belly of this fish, we find a, a, an attitude, a spirit, a heart of repentance. He remembered God's goodness and he remembered God's almighty power. He repented of his wrongdoing and he ultimately rededicated himself back into a right relationship with his God. Now here's the test. The test would be whether this was all done so God would simply get him out of trouble or whether, or whether he would be sincere in the commitments and the vows that he had made to fulfill them 
the vows that he had made there in the whale's belly because he tells us in verse number nine, I will pay that that I have vowed. I've been around long enough and you've been around long enough to know that there are a great many people that really don't have a whole lot of time for God and really aren't all that interested in serving God and, and in recognizing God and acknowledging him in their life until they turn into a, a, a difficult time. And in that difficult time, maybe it's a, it's a diagnosis of, of health or, 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 or perhaps it's a, a health issue with someone in their family. Maybe it's a financial problem or maybe they, they've gotten wind that, uh, that, that the work is downsizing and they might be on the, on the chopping block and it's at that moment that they turn to God and they say, oh God, if you'll, if you'll spare me, if you'll allow me to come out of this and, and to still have my job and to still have my health and to still be able to pay my bills, then God, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. Maybe even some that have found themselves on the wrong side of the law and, and have found themselves going into a, a courtroom for a trial and, and, and having to hire a lawyer and, and, and looking at the possibility of spending some time behind bars and then saying, now God, if you'll get me out of this mess, if you'll get me out of this trouble that I've, I've made out of my life, then I will, I will repent, I will turn back to you. And look, that, that's all fine and good. The, the test is, will they actually do it if God gets them out? And I've been around long enough to, to, to see people get real spiritual during their difficult trials. I, I've spent a lot of time with people in the midst. Of, I'm not talking about little kids. I'm not talking about teenagers. I'm talking about adults who are suddenly, all of a sudden, they're saying the right things. There, there seems to be a, a spirit and attitude of, look, I, I've got to get my life back on track. I've got to do the right thing. God, I'm going to pay that which I have vowed to you. Perhaps God allows for them to escape whatever trouble they found themselves in. God intervenes in their life. It's not long. It's not long before they're back doing the exact same thing. It's not long before they have completely forgotten the vows and the commitments that they once made. It's not long before they're back to living that old lifestyle and, and, and all the things that they said during their moment of trouble is in the rearview mirror. Jonah, Jonah repented. Now God is going to give him a test. Jonah, was that real? Jonah, was that sincere? Jonah, you've made some vows. Are you going to fulfill the vows that you have made? Remember, a vow is a very serious thing. According to Ecclesiastes chapter number 5 and verse number 4, when thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. It's very possible there's someone sitting here this morning. You said, you know, I probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the fact that I promised God if he would get me out of this or if he'd get me out of that, that I would go back to church. That's very possible. Maybe with someone sitting here this very morning, that, that that's the circumstances that surround the fact that you're here today. I applaud you for fulfilling your vow. I believe God certainly has much more for you than just, just attending church, but that's a good first step. The first part of Jonah's test is this idea of repentance, getting right with God. But notice, we see secondly, we find God's message to Jonah in verse number two. And God would put Jonah's words to the ultimate test. Perhaps Jonah would think, well, God would, never, God would never send me back to Nineveh. He would never give me that call again. I so disappointed him the first time. How can I possibly be used by God? And yet God comes back and God says, okay, Jonah, go back to Nineveh. Go warn them. Go preach to them judgment. The one thing that Jonah had resisted, which was warning Nineveh of God's coming destruction, he would be asked to do once again. Listen, Jonah learned. Jonah would learn that the 40-day countdown did not begin upon his hearing about it, but rather it would begin once the Ninevites heard. You see, there was an element by fleeing to Tarshish in which Jonah thought he could run out the clock. You, you, you understand that, right? Okay, God said 40, 40 days and judgment's going to fall. Well, let's see, how long will it take me to get to Tarshish? And if I, were to, if I were to go to Tarshish and spend a week or two there, 
Certainly by the time I come back, certainly 40 days would be up, destruction will have fallen, and no one will know the difference. No one will know that I had been commissioned. And Jonah begins to cleverly scheme and, and plan and plot out his, 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 his thoughts of how can I run out the clock? How can I run out these 40 days? God comes to him the second time. And Jonah learns, oh, they still have 40 days. They will always have 40 days until someone goes and someone warns them. Someone tells them that it's time for them to repent. When God came the second time, Jonah finally understood this truth that God's judgment would fall and that it does fall, but not, listen, not before sufficient warning is given. God had called him to deliver that particular message. I'm wondering, who has God called you to warn? Who has God, who has God placed in your path and put a burden on your heart and said, that's the one right there. You need to talk to them. You don't need to talk to them about the weather. We're good at talking about the weather, aren't we? You don't need to talk to them about politics. We're really good at talk about talking about politics. You don't need to talk to them about sports, about the economy. No, no, you need to talk to that person about Christ. You need to talk to that person about their sin problem. You need to warn them of the fact that if they don't get right with God, if they don't repent of their sin, that they're going to die and spend eternity in a place the Bible calls hell. Who has God called you to share your faith with? Don't run from this call. Listen, as his people, we are to be bold ambassadors in sharing our faith. May God, may God convict us of just how timid we can be when it comes to this particular aspect. We're bold, again, to talk about these other things. But oftentimes, we're so hesitant to talk to folks about Christ. So Jonah's second part of this test would be God's message coming to him a second time. And by the way, God did not change the message just because Jonah didn't like it. A lot of times we, 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 we live in a day and age in which, well, you know, okay, well, you don't like that. Well, let me give you something else. And God says to Jonah, you don't like it. That's too bad. It's still what I've called you to do. I'm not changing my mind. And so God's message is still the same. Notice, thirdly, we see here under Jonah's test, we see Jonah's obedience. Look at verse number three. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. You and I must know the value and level of importance that God places upon obedience. Samuel told Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse number 22, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, now listen, to obey is better. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken or to listen or to do what you're told to do is better than the fat of rams. Here's what God is teaching us. To obey is better than any religious act or ritual that we can do. In other words, I'm, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you get up every morning and you read your Bible, but if you don't obey it, what good does it do you? Hey, look, I'm really glad that you're in church this morning and that you come faithfully, but if you leave this place and you live just like everybody else lives and, and you never respond to God's leading in your life, you might as well stay home. You might as well never get out of bed. You might as well stay there on Sunday morning rather than coming. Because listen, it's great to be in church. It's great to read your Bible. It's great to give an offering. It's great to do these things. But if it's not backed up by a life of obedience, God says, listen, those things are worthless. To obey is better. Jonah learned that lesson. And when God came to him the second time, Jonah responded. Jonah obeyed. There's a man by the name of Erastus Corning. Some of you might recognize that name. When Erastus was just a little boy, he applied for a shop, at a shop for employment. The foreman at that particular shop looked down at the frail, lame little boy, and he asked, why, my little fellow, what can you do? I can do what I am bid, sir, was the answer. His willingness to obey secured a place and was the beginning of a very successful business career as a merchant and eventually even a politician from the state of New York. And it started with just a little boy who said, what can I do? Well, I'll do whatever you tell me. That's a good start, isn't it? You, you that have a job interview this week, why don't you try that out? Why don't you sit down and what, what can you do? I, boss, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. That'll get, you, that'll get you on, I think, pretty quickly. 
obedience, to, to obey, to respond. That Jonah's obedience, the Bible says, so Jonah arose and went. You know what God's looking for? God's looking for obedience. I want you to see, lastly, if we consider this test that Jonah took, we see secondly here Jonah's example. Jonah sets an example for us in a couple of different ways. As Jonah makes his way to Nineveh, I want you to notice in verse number four, the Bible says this, and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Notice verse number five. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. We see here Jonah's example. You know, Jonah's message is, and his prophecy was, as far as, we, as far as we have revealed for us, it was eight words in length. He walks into the city and he begins to yell as he walks down the center street, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's it. He does not convince them of the validity of his message with great oratory or flowery speech. He does not tell funny, cute stories. He does not emotionally pull on their heartstrings. He has no clever illustrations to, uh, to reveal his truth. He walks into the city and he preaches an eight-word message. Some of you wish I would have done that this morning. <laughs> and I wish I, could, I only had to say eight words and we'd all do the right thing, right? We're all in the same boat here. He, he says eight words. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's it. Simple message. So how did, how did Nineveh experience such an amazing revival through, the, through, through, through an eight-word message? Uh, very, very little is, is stated other than just, now again, maybe he said more than this, but the Bible doesn't tell us that. So how does that happen? Well, I believe it's because Jonah was a walking example or he was a walking illustration of the message that he had been commissioned to preach. I believe this in two ways. Number one, I want you to notice that Jonah is a walking example of this first thought. This is this, that God punishes sin. All they had to do was look at Jonah, and they knew right away, <laughs> you disobey God, that's what happens. Don't you think that three days and three nights in the belly of a whale Perhaps some believe that Jonah himself maybe even died while he was in that whale and God resurrected him. God brought him back to life. Don't you think that that might leave a mark, so to speak? Don't you think that perhaps maybe he looked a little bit different? Maybe the color of his hair was a little unusual. Don't you think that perhaps maybe as he's walking, there was a, maybe a certain odor that emanated from him after having spent three days and three nights in the belly of this creature? Don't you think that, that all of these things would have pointed to the fact that, whoa, this guy's been through something. This guy has experienced something. Why? Why, Jonah? Why do you look this way? Why do you smell this way? Well, I've got a story to tell. God told me to give you this message a while ago, and I, I decided to do my own thing. I decided to go my own way. I was thrown overboard of this ship, and, and a whale swallowed me, and I spent three days and three nights, and I determined if I ever got out of there, I would never disobey God again. God got my attention, and I'm telling you, residents of Nineveh, God can get your attention too. You need to listen to what I'm trying to tell you. I believe that Jonah was a walking example of the fact that God punishes sin and sinners. Think with me. Isaiah 13, verse number 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish, I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. And Jonah walked through that city and he was a living, breathing example of the fact that God brings punishment and judgment into the lives of sinners. 
Romans 6.23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death. Revelation 21 and verse number 8 tell us what the end result of that death is. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Yes, God is a God of love, and he's a God of mercy, and he's a God of compassion and grace. But listen, at the end of the day, God is going to breathe out judgment and punishment and wrath upon sin and upon sinners who refuse to repent. Jonah walked through that city, and he says, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And those people looked at Jonah, and they said, If if God will do that to him for simply disobeying and not doing what God asked him to do, and they began to look inward, and they began to see our idolatry and perhaps our perversion and our immorality and our wickedness and our blasphemy. And if God will do that to him, imagine what he's going to do to us in 40 days. Yes, truly, God punishes sin. But can I say the second thought is that Jonah became a tremendous example of not only the fact that God punishes sin, but that God pardons sinners. Listen to what the Bible says in Isaiah 55 in verse number 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I want you to know, yes, God punishes sin, but God also pardons sinners. When they looked at Jonah, they saw a man who had just emerged from three days and three nights in the belly of this fish because of his sin, because of his refusal to obey. But they also looked at a man who was still alive, a man who still had breath within him, who still had strength, who still had a voice to be able to proclaim. And they realized, yes, God punishes sin. No question about it. But, but God also pardons sinners. And if we'll, if we'll turn from our wicked way, maybe, just maybe, we can avoid the judgment that's coming in 40 days. Amen. They fell on their faces, and they repented. They believed God, the Bible says in verse number 5, and they proclaimed a fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them, and Nineveh experienced revival because they understood the truth that God punishes sin and that God pardons Sinners, can I tell you, the conditions of pardon are always the same. There was no pardon. There was no ejecting from the whale's belly until Jonah remembered God, until Jonah repented, until Jonah recommitted himself and said, okay, God, I get it. I will do whatever you've asked me to do. And at that moment, when repentance, true repentance entered into Jonah's heart and into Jonah's life, God says, okay, now I'll pardon you. Get this guy out of this whale's belly. Send, send word to him the second time. Hey, get back to Nineveh. Do what I asked you to do the first time. But listen, none of that would have transpired. None of that would have transpired unless Jonah first repented. I want you to know something. For some of you, grace and mercy and peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, it is this close. It's this close. How do you get it? You remember God? You remember his word, you repent of your sin, you do things his way, and he will abundantly pardon. See, we're living in a day and age, we want to do things our way. We want to do that which pleases us. We want to tell God how it ought to be, and yet there's still a God in heaven who says this, now you come to me, let's reason together. You repent, and you do the right thing, and and you'll find forgiveness, and you'll find grace, and you'll find love, and you'll find mercy. The conditions are the same. God does, God does not pardon. God will never pardon except there first be repentance and then obedience. Amen. Jonah is an illustration of that truth. As Jonah walked through that city, his example was this. Hey, 40 days, and the God that did this to me is capable of doing something far worse to you. And they looked at him and they said, yeah, but the same God who did that to you when you repented, he gave you a second chance. 
maybe, just maybe, we ought to do the same. Our heads are